welcome to this Investec Live panel on cancer awareness. In today's discussion, we will be separating fact from fiction when it comes to cancer diagnoses and treatments. We will also be looking at the financial implications of a diagnosis, and we hope that today's discussion gives you more knowledge to make better decisions about your health and your finances. Professor Carol Benn is a world-renowned breast cancer surgeon and breast disease specialist. She established and runs Africa's first and only breast cancer centre of excellence at Netcare Mill Park in Johannesburg. Welcome, Professor Benn. Monica De Santos is an Investec employee who was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma, a type of lung cancer, at the age of 23. She shared her story with us in 2019, but we've invited her back to find out about her journey since then. And we also welcome Kailash Rama, who is Head of Underwriting at Investec Life. And Kailash will guide us through the financial considerations that come with a cancer diagnosis. Welcome, ladies. October, Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and we know that in South Africa, one in 27 women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime. Um, and it is the most common uh, cancer affecting women in South Africa. Um, Having been diagnosed with breast cancer when I was 35, I can attest to being terrified when I heard like, the big C. And I can, I can identify with women who are too scared to even do a self-examination or go for a mammogram. But now that I've kind of been through it, I realize that diagnosis is, is the early diagnosis is key. Um, and so in your opinion, Carol, what are some of the biggest myths around cancer diagnoses and treatment? So, so I think what you say is so important. All of us live with this fear of this C word and cancer word. And we sit here with a gorgeous young child so admiring her arms, her <laughs> Jimmy arms there, um, about cancer. And I think what we need to realize is that as cell divides, they undergo changes. And if our genetic material doesn't fix that cell, which is what the first part, then the little environment around the cells, the little tumor microenvironment is supposed to do that and it grows its own cancer plant. So oftentimes you may have family history or you may not. It's about knowing your norm and checking your body. And I was lecturing to the medical students today. The medical environment is such a hostile environment that often people are scared about what they find and what it means to them. So uh, talks like this are so important because know your norm if you find something that you are not sure about make sure you go and see a good practitioner and make sure people don't boohoo and go oh it's nothing or you're just fatigued or it's just a gland or something because what you want is you want the right investigations and that's where you want to be careful that you understand funding and funding models okay which means that check your breasts if you're under 35 and you find something you go for an ultrasound if you're over you go for a mammogram and ultrasound Go for your pap smears, you have your vaccines for HPV, if you feel funny glands up as a youngster, make sure they do sonars and they do the right needle biopsies. Understand the cost before. I always say there's no such thing as an emergency biopsy because what happens is I'm sometimes horrified when people come to me and go, well, we spend 14,000 Rand on this and the, then the pathology was 12,000 Rand and it's not a cancer and I've got no more savings. So there's no emergency, but you must take that step and sometimes going with a friend. And I don't think people don't know when there's a problem, they do. It is exactly what you're saying, it's that fear of the unknown. So you know if you've got a headache, you know if you've got a lump in your breast, but you're scared. And you're also scared of the potential consequence. So it's important to myth bust that. You don't need your breast off, you can take time with the diagnosis, multidisciplinary for any cancer is critical for care it's your body not the doctors we spend more time choosing how which car we buy which fridge we choose which microwave but not making sure that our health team is is carefully audited and that's why i like multidisciplinary so i like the concept of people having many doctors available and many pathologists to double check on their information then there's so many different treatment options. Again, that's where you will come in, around fancy medicines and new things and so many changes in oncology. Not everyone needs chemo. Um, Monica, let's move on to your story. Um, you've had quite a journey. I mean, you found out that you had a large tumour on your lungs when you were 32 weeks pregnant. Yes, I was 32 um, weeks pregnant, yeah. And before you got cancer, you had a very healthy lifestyle, didn't smoke. I mean, you must have been totally like 
blind side. I was side shocked. Of. I was very shocked. I could always tell that there was something wrong because I wasn't feeling okay. And I had a lot of strange symptoms like weight loss. My hair was falling out. I had severe pain in my shoulder and I just kept getting chest infections, pneumonia and things like that. And eventually when I was diagnosed with this cancer, I was in complete shock. I was gymming every day, eating healthily. You know, I wasn't drinking or smoking. So yeah, it was a very big shock. <laughs> And so you courageously got through it all, went into remission, um, and then your cancer came back. Yes. So take us through where you are now and, and your decision, your initial decision not to have chemo. Okay. So I had been in remission for over five years, so about six years. And last year, I started experiencing really strange symptoms where I was just losing weight, unexplained weight loss. And then I had a persistent cough that just would not go away and pain around my liver area. So in December, I decided to see my oncologist after delaying for like three months because I just, <laughs> I didn't want to hear what was going on. I knew like intuitively, you know, something's wrong. Went to see him, had a CT scan. They discovered that the mass had grown. So I always had a residual mass in my lung, but it was dormant. It was like scar tissue. The mass had grown and I had a large pearl effusion, which is basically fluid in your lung. So I had surgery in January. I had a thoracoscopy, which is a surgery that they do through your rib cage into your lung um, to drain the fluid and also to biopsy the mass. And it came back as Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, but I knew that intuitively. I was just like, oh, it's back. And it's, what Car it's what Carol's oh, saying, you know, you know, you know your you own body. You can feel it, you can feel it, yes. And when they told me that it was back, I wasn't surprised because I had already prepared myself for it, but I refused medical convention. I did not want to go for chemo. I was quite traumatized from the first time, so I was like, absolutely not. Plus my hair was really long. I created a whole business from my hair and I was like, I can't lose my hair again. And um, after a few months, so I decided to become a fruitarian where I completely changed my diet, cut meat out, went on a fruitarian diet, lost like 10 kilograms, it just fell off. And it was unsustainable. So I had been doing that for about four months and I just couldn't live that way anymore. I was weak, I wasn't able to train like I used to and I just felt really unwell. So I started eating normally again. And when I started eating normally again, the, my cancer seemed to have just grown like crazy. So for those four months where I was eating the fruitarian diet, the cancer hadn't changed, it was stable. But as soon as I started eating meat again, it just grew rapidly and then I was forced to actually do treatment. And I'm so grateful that I did because it got to a point where my symptoms from the cancer were so unbearable. I was in constant pain, I wasn't able to sleep. I had severe itching from the lymphoma, it's, it's a side effect of the cancer. And my hair was falling out regardless. So I just decided I need to go and see a doctor and get this treated. And that was honestly the best decision I ever made. And where are you at in your journey now? So I've been on chemo for three months now. I have one more round left, and then we'll be doing a stem cell transplant followed by immunotherapy for a year. Yeah. I mean, Carol, this is something you hear all the time. You know, someone's, it's always try CBD oil or do this or yeah. do that. What, what are, you, you know? don't blame people because you, you heard how, remember I spoke about host, hostile hospital environment, how hard the journey is and no one wants to go through it. What it is, it's a tipping scale about how you, how you can manage. Remember I spoke about the micro environment with the cancer and the balance. So it's about listening and always making sure there's an open rapport between doctors and patients. And doctors often practice vertical medicine where they're like, do this, and if you don't do this, there's the door. We're not kids, okay? So it's about making sure that there's a holistic environment. And we do know today, exercise is hugely important both from a prehab and a rehab point of view. And what we know today is with these, particularly some of these lymphomas, which have got genetic background to them, not familial, but something that's happened, then um, knocking out your, whatever those little cell lines that are causing the problem, doing a stem cell, often we have really, really good and durable and long outcomes. outcomes. But the treatment's difficult, you know? So kudos to you. It is and, difficult. And, yeah. and, you inspire us all. Thank so well you. done. Exercise has been a big part of my journey. 100%. If it wasn't for training, I would probably be bedridden. So the first round of chemo that I had, I wasn't able to train before I had that chemo. So I was really thin. I had lost so much weight. I was really weak. And the side effects were just hectic from the cancer. So when I had that first round of chemo, I was out for a week. I 
completely wasn't able to take care of myself. My mother-in-law had to come and look after me because I couldn't cook, I could barely walk, I had a migraine for four days straight that wouldn't go away. It was extremely difficult exhausted, I couldn't get out of bed. I actually had to force myself to get out of bed because I was so afraid of what laying in bed all day would do to me. And after that week, I pushed myself and decided I need to go back to gym and I need to start eating meat again because my body cannot handle this. And the moment I did that, everything changed. Like my next round of chemo, it, was, it, was, it wasn't a walk in the park, but it was nothing compared to the first round. I was able to get over the side effects within three days and back at gym the day after chemo, and it really was so, hectic. So that's it. Cancer doesn't just affect a person. It affects them and their family, okay? And then you've got the issues about work and finances and everything to take into account. It's not one size fits all. Each person's different. Each cancer's different. And you want today, treatment is de-escalated and personalized. So you want that approach to make sure that people are having a clear passport of what their options are for their journey. And not everyone requires surgery, for example, for breast cancer. I also think we need to take cognizance of cost in oncology. The clever, clever, the biologics, the target treatments, the immunotherapies, where, where people have access to support. So I'm really glad you're here. I tried to write on the medical aids, I was useless. I still don't know the one end from the other, but all, all I know is that even people on medical aids have co-payments, too many people don't have access to funding. I mean, I run free service clinics, even up in, in um, Tinsualo and everything, because it's, a, it's hugely hard for people to find where you get care and what the cost is. You know, I'm sure, Monica, the last thing on your mind was, uh, you know, life insurance or severe illness cover when you were in your 20s. I mean, is that, is that something you see Absolutely. regularly? Absolutely. And I'm just listening to Carol talk about People look after their cars, they look after their houses, but they don't look after their bodies, you know. And Monica talking about, you know, she's going to have stem cell treatment. And all of that costs a lot of money. So if you look at life insurance and the way insurance has, has moved and evolved, things have changed. However, people still have this perception, like it's almost like a grudge purchase. Why do I need to get life insurance? I'm so young. Why do I need severe illness cover? I'm too young. And they don't realize, you know, the... Um, the benefits of having it at a later stage, if you do require it. That's honestly one of my biggest regrets. I didn't have cover. And I thought after the first time, you know, it's never going to happen again. I've done this. I'm fine. I'm healthy. And it did. And now I have so many medical bills that medical aid is not covering. So it's, it's a bit, Can you yeah. take cover once you diagnose? That's exactly what my next question <laughs> was. Can you? Um, no, unfortunately not. Uh, so not if you're just diagnosed. It's unlikely that they will get insurance from any, any insurance company uh, because they've just been diagnosed, obviously. And also we would take into account the different stages. So if someone applies for cover and they've been diagnosed with, with the cancer, say, for example, two years ago, and their staging was relatively low, so stage one or stage two, we can possibly start looking at cover. However, if you are stage four and you've applied for insurance, unfortunately, I don't think there's any uh, insurance company that would offer terms um, immediately. You know, with stage four, it's a little bit more tricky because there's metastases involved and we need to take that into consideration. Talk to me about how do you actually assess someone's risk? So what we look at from an underwriting perspective is that we don't only look at your health condition. So if you've come in for cover, you've been diagnosed with a condition, we would look at that, of course, but we would also take into account, are you smoking? Are you drinking? How much are you drinking? Um, do you have any other illnesses that we need to be concerned about? Because if, you um, if you've been diagnosed with cancer, now you've also got lack of mental health disorder, you also have obesity. So it's all these risk factors that we uh, take into account. What is your family history like? So even for people that don't necessarily apply, and they have, when they've had cancer, if they have applied for cover and they have a family history of cancer, we'd also be concerned about that. Carol, I mean, you've been at the forefront of breast disease research for, for years, and like, what, are, what is exciting you about the future? What are some of the shifts you're seeing? What, what, what's coming? So, are we gonna get a vaccine for so breast cancer? So I absolutely <laughs> hope for BRCA yeah. within the next couple of years, but I do think that the shifts have been monumental. Look, 
when, when I'm old, I'm 57. When I was um, at medical school, we taught that mastectomy is a gold standard. It took us 20 years to work out that it has equal survival to a breast saving and radiation. Now we know the survival's better if you have a breast saving and radiation than even a mastectomy with radiation. We know today that less people need chemo. We genetically profile cells and work out what treatment people need. So it's a super exciting field because we're gonna, be, we're gonna need less and less aggressive and more and more focused and personal. So that is amazing, which is the reason why we wanna encourage people to screen early and pick up things early because there's so many significant changes. For someone watching this, what would your like, key takeaway that you want them to walk away with? What would you want them to know from this? So nothing is ever as scary as it seems. When we first think of cancer, we feel like we're going to lose our hair and we're going to lose our identity and we're going to just wither away into nothing. But when you're actually in the experience, it's not as painful or as scary as you imagined it to be. So just relax and trust that everything is going to unfold perfectly for you. Things that you can control is firstly how you see things, your mindset and your perspective, and then exercise and what you eat. And that makes a huge difference in terms of how you feel. Just focus on the present moment and don't allow yourself to think of what's going to happen next. Just focus on right now and how can I relax and get through this moment. And that's what really helps. So wise. She is. You've got like this calmness you. about you. It's, you. it's phenomenal. I've had to practice. Wow. Being a calm, happy person is a skill that you need to practice every day. We need to condition our minds to focus on the positive. You don't just wake up a positive, happy-go-lucky person, especially not when you're facing serious challenges in life. You have to really challenge your thoughts every single day and select the thoughts that serve you and make you feel good. Also, what you consume is super important. So the music you listen to, the type of lyrics that you're listening to, the things that you're watching on TV, your mind is like a suitcase Absolutely. and you need to fill it with things that are going to make you stronger and make you feel better and make you positive. If you're watching news and you're watching all these scary things about people dying of cancer and all sorts of things, you're going to be terrified. Absolutely. And Kailash, you know, from a financial perspective, what are your, what is the sort of key observation you want to make around the importance of having cover in place? Uh, what do you want to tell people? I think like if you have to take into account what Monica was talking about and she mentioned the fact that she has to have stem cell therapy and Carol Ben was talking about all the different new cancer treatments that are coming into the market it's going to be very expensive. And I can't imagine that medical aid would cover all of those costs. So you need to have cover in place to take care of those added expenses that might, you, that might occur. Secondly, I think you need to, um, to realize that severe illness cover is a living benefit. So you need it for when, whilst you are still alive to cater for all other expenses that might arise um, if you've been diagnosed with a severe illness uh, disease and like I mentioned it could be cancer it could be stroke it could be heart attack and you might need the money for something other than your treatment you might need it to renovate your house build the ramps because you're wheelchair bound and you need to go up and down or whatever the case might be so because of that um, yeah that's where the financial aspect will come in so it kind of gives you the breathing room and the space yes. to to help you on your path to recovery yes Ladies, thank you. I mean, wonderful conversation and insights and to such courage. I mean, just, yeah, you're an inspiration. <laughs> and Carol, I mean, thank you for everything Pleasure. you do and the, the fight that you fight um, on behalf of, of people everywhere. Absolute privilege. Um, thank you. And Kailesh, thank you for your insights. Pleasure. Cool. Thanks, guys.